you know, through the years, we've looked at a lot of different photos and not often do you go through a card and all of a sudden your eyes pop out. That's exactly how this particular story starts. I was looking through a card and all of a sudden I see this mega giant. Now, not only did we have one mega giant in this area, we had another one. So here's two different mega giants as we go into the fall of 2020 that we're definitely going to be keying in on. So actually this is a brand new farm, 80 acres, and the Reconyx photos started rolling in late July. Two of the biggest deer in my life show up. We both thought two 200 inch deer potential are alive on this farm and it was just phenomenal to see the, the giant bucks that were on this farm. Uh, we had teardrop. Those two drop tines side by side coming down were as if two tears were rolling down his face and we were like, man, teardrop is an absolute giant. The other one we really didn't name because he wasn't on our hit list per se. We just knew that he was a giant. We felt like he was probably four and a half years old. Okay, fast forward from summer into October 1st and uh, we were going in with high hopes to chase after teardrop. Now it was a matter of making the right decisions, hunting him on the right wind, and we had the perfect stage to go in and try and do that. Big giant clover field surrounded by heavy cover, and then we put a radish and wintergrass field at one end of that clover field. We actually had two muddy bulls so that we could hunt this particular deer on a variety of different winds. So once October hits, we can't wait to get in there and try our luck on teardrop. I've been so excited for this hunt. We've been hunting Missouri, but I've been thinking about this sit because I've been watching the wind on deer cast and it's been predicting it. And I couldn't wait to get in here and see where all these deer come out. First sits are always so awesome. So it's opening night, deer cast says great. And Wade and I go in and who shows up but High Scraper. Ooh, he's pretty. Holy buckets, he's nice. Pretty, pretty. Now here's this giant 10, which 99 out of 100 hunts, you try and put that arrow through his side, but not with this 200 in the area. Hard to do, but we passed this giant 10 hoping that teardrop would show up. Many of the pictures during the summer, these two bucks were running together. What a nice encounter. A beautiful deer. We waited till dark, no show from teardrop. A few nights later, I have a wedding to attend for my nephew Whalen. And of course, it is the cold front of all cold fronts. The rains are coming down and who shows up about two hours before dark, but teardrop. Great Reconyx photos of him. He literally walked between the two blinds right down the edge of that radish and wintergrass field and the clover. And I was like, okay, we didn't get him this night, but my confidence is high. He's still here. We've just got to make it happen. So as we continue on through the season, we were still getting pictures of Teardrop, but it was kind of random when he was showing up. You know, we'd go to another farm where we wouldn't have the wind right. And uh, we'd be getting those Reconyx reports. And, and there he stands right out in front of the blind, but the wind was not right. So we weren't able to get in there on him, but we still had high hopes that he was in the area. So here we are, October 17th rolls in and deer cast says poor. The wind is not right to hunt the plot for teardrop. So Mark ends up going to 80 acres, about a half mile away from the same spot that teardrop's been frequenting in hopes that maybe he moved over there because he's been gone off the cameras in the Reconyx for quite some time. All right, we needed, we pretty much needed a west to northwest wind to go in there and hunt teardrop. The wind switches out of the southeast. I decide one night to just go scouting in the general area. I'm about a half mile away. And man, the night I had, I couldn't even believe it. I decided to come sit a blind that brings back great memories. This is where I killed Big Frame last year. Hunted this spot a lot. And uh, it's about 6 p.m. We got a pile of does out on this clover field. It's a great little spot, a uh, lot of cover. And this is one of the only green fields around. So I'm in here scouting, looking for a couple different deer that we've had pictures of. 
and I, I don't know that I've got my cameras in the exact right place because I feel like they're coming out here more than the camera show. So I came to sit it myself. And who do I end up encountering but that giant four and a half year old. The footage is just awesome and worth sharing. Boy, did he put on a show that night for Mark. Night plays out, he's not on our hit list. We just roll the footage and enjoy the evening. I mean, he puts on a show and you look at him and you're like, man, why are you not shooting this deer? Well, one reason and one reason only, and that's teardrop. He comes in, another unbelievable buck comes in, and it was just one of those nights I was like, man, this is just too good to be true. I wish we had a bow in the blind. This buck comes out, and it, it's a field where I'd killed big frame the previous year, and he is just, I mean, he's doing the march. He wasn't on our hit list, but nonetheless, the footage is just, an Iowa whitetail being an Iowa whitetail. It is, it is beautiful. Season rolls on, pictures slow down, and all of a sudden another couple giants show up and we change our tactics just a little bit. I ended up killing a 180 and then a 200 just a few days apart and my attention was off of teardrop. So that night that Mark killed his 200 inch deer, we had Reconyx pictures of teardrop going to bed. So this is the first time in a while we have the right wind and right conditions to go in and hunt teardrop and wades up to bat. Just an unbelievable opportunity for me to get to kill a absolute world-class whitetail. Wade was practicing. He wanted to make sure that he was dead on. And as usual, on the target range, he's dead on. He has a high confidence level. Mine's high. Perry's is high. Hopefully, Teardrop shows up and we get to find out whether Wade can get it done on this giant Iowa whitetail. recipe you need to get a big giant on his feet during daylight. We have, we have sat this spot, we're going back to the well because we keep going there but we haven't had a drink yet and uh, we'll see if today is the weather that brings him out. So the deer movement started early 
and uh, it was lots of does just filing out into this giant clover field. We had some smaller bucks popping out, a little bit nicer bucks, and uh, Perry spots a nice racked buck up on the hillside. Couldn't get a positive identification on him, but he thought it could be teardrop. I'm sitting there filming, I see a deer go across the, the hillside in front of us, and I was like, guys, that really looked like a big deer, but I don't know who it was. And not five minutes later, across the plot, he pops out. Once he stepped into that clover field, I felt like I was going to have a heart attack. It was one of the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. And uh, to get an opportunity at that deer was just unbelievable. You know, it's one thing to see a deer on your trail camera photos, and then all of a sudden to see him in person, it was just like a surreal experience. I mean, just looking at that deer for the first time ever, uh, we were like, man, is tonight the night? Is Wade going to get it done on this absolute world-class whitetail? field starts filling up. I mean, it's one of those nights where deer cast said great and the movement was off the charts. And all of a sudden, something cleared this field. We, did, we weren't sure what it was, but something cleared them and pushed the entire herd back into that ridge west of us. But Teardrop didn't clear completely out of the world. We saw him stop over there on that hillside. And you could tell by his demeanor, he started to calm back down. So whatever it was that cleared them, wasn't that big of a surprise to him. It wasn't enough danger to get him out of the country. He's standing there on that hillside in the cover. The question now is, is he gonna come back out to this field and give us a shot? So as he stood up on that hill, what seemed like for hours, it was probably, you know, 15, 20 minutes, he was messing with other bucks. He finally calmed down enough from whatever spooked him. And uh, finally he started working his way back to the field where he should have came out the first time. He's in there scraping, making all kinds of ruckus. And all of a sudden we all three look at each other and he's walking straight to the radish field. And what do you know? He's heading our way. When he gets to the edge of the radish field where he should step out at 60 yards and he turns right there and makes a scrape. Come on, Wade, make that shot, buddy. Stop. Good. And off to the south, another buck catches his eye. He ended up taking his attention to another buck. They sift south, he works a scrape till dark, and we sat there till well after dark and snuck out of that blind thinking, are we ever going to see Teardrop again? So fast forward a couple days, here it is, October 23rd. We never got another picture of Teardrop. And uh, that same time frame, that four and a half year old buck that Mark scouted a few days prior, he also disappeared. November turns to December, December goes all the way through, then January hits, Still no teardrop, still no big four and a half year old. And now we're starting to worry just a little bit where they killed, you know, did a car hit them? Did another hunter hit them? Did EHD take them? We just weren't quite sure exactly what could have happened to these two giants. So the moment the season was over, 
uh, you get to January 10th, the season ends, it's January the 11th, we go ahead and start pouring the analogics to them. If they're around, we really feel confident that we're going to get a picture on one of our analogics feed sites. Wade and I put feed out, analogics out, to try and get pictures of him late after season's over, nothing. Then it's shed season, and here's where the story takes an unfortunate twist. We went in shed hunting that thicket, and uh, we didn't come 150 yards off that field edge, and there's a steep ravine, and I walked over the edge, and all I saw was just a cluster of tines all wrapped up together, and immediately, that second, I knew it was teardrop. Never fun finding them like this. He's magnificent here. That's crazy. Look where I see the little drop time. Right there. Dang it. Just not the way you want to find them, but I guess that cl closes the chapter on old teardrop. Man. Wade found them, uh, he gets the salvage tags and lets me know immediately. So I'm turkey hunting and I get the text from Wade and I'm like, oh man, I mean, that is not the news you want when you're out of state on a hunt, having a good time. And then all of a sudden, I mean, just unbelievable. It does answer the question, but nonetheless, it's really bittersweet. And not so much because we didn't get the chance to go in there and harvest that particular buck, but just how they ended up succumbing to mother nature. Never the way you want to find them. At least we have closure on Teardrop and that giant four and a half year old, uh, not the closure we wanted. I would have rather been sitting behind Teardrop that October evening, but mother nature had other plans in store. I get home from Texas and uh, of course, Wade wants to show me these two bucks and I'm like, it's, it's just astounding to see that mass of antlers locked together. I mean, it's, it's something you seldom see as a deer hunter and uh, it just, you can see why they got locked up. If you look at the configuration of the two racks and then you put them together, like once they were molded together, there was no getting them apart. Oh man. Very unfortunate. Holy cow. A lot of antlers. I mean, they're, oh my goodness. Are they ever locked? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell which one's which. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's teardrop with the drop and the other one that's gone. Yeah, you can see this wacky tine that comes up, just locked them, locked them solid. Oh, you talk about two giant, giant Iowa deer. What'd you think when you saw them down there, Wade? I mean, well, you found it right there where we were hunting. Even. Yeah, you know, we went in looking specifically for what happened to Teardrop and this giant four and a half year old. And uh, I came over that little rise, looked in the creek and saw nothing but antler. And I was like, well, that's what happened to him, unfortunately. Oh, you got him tagged, obviously, but hey man, that's just a terrible ending for those two guys. I mean, it, that's the worst part about it. Like you, you just never want to see a whitetail come to his end like that, yeah. like, never. Yep, they're in a deep ditch. You know, there was no getting getting out together, that's for sure, so very wow. unfortunate. Golly. So that is the end of the story. It's not the ending we wanted, but it's the ending to a real heartbreaker, if you will. The one deer, the four and a half year old was high 180s, like 187. Teardrop ended up right in that 212 to 215 range. Of course, he was missing that drop time that came off but uh, just a mega giant. He was everything we hoped he would be. It's just the ending of the story is not the one we had hoped for. The results are in. DeerCast said it was supposed to be a great night. Well, here you go. DeerCast said great. It doesn't exist anywhere else but in DeerCast. Hunters love DeerCast's exclusive deer movement forecast. Get ahead of your game with DeerCast. <laughs> We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Leopold.